Okay, well I know it might be kind of distracting seeing me here in all my sexiness, but you know, you're just, you're just going to have to deal with it. Um, no, I'm just kidding, I can't. There was a video made by a guy, he calls himself Anti-Bullshit Man. Now, I am not going to call him um, Anti-Bullshit Man. Um, but I'm not going to call him Inmentam Jr. anymore, because in this video, uh, he said something that wasn't completely retarded. He, he, he made a great leap for him. And so I'm just going to call him Lou. Because he looks like a Lou. You look at his face, you know, if he said his name was Lou, you know, I, I, I could see that. He has a, has a Lou-ish facial structure. I was perusing a bunch of videos about the Wisconsin protest stuff, and I saw his video. And so I went to his video, clicked on his video, um, thumbed down the video, and was going to respond to a few comments. But after, when I thumbed it down, I saw that there, it was already massively thumbed down. And so I thought, wow. Lou must have said something smart or correct. I mean, if all the subscribers hate it, he must have said something smart or correct, and indeed he did. Uh, what he said was that these employees at, you know, in, in, in Wisconsin, that they're all privileged. They're, they, all have a, they all have it pretty good, and they can take some cuts, is, is what he was saying. And that, and that it's a, a good idea that these cuts... Uh, occurred. And of course he got a bunch of heat for that, right? And he also said, and I think this also pissed a lot of people off, um, a lot of his subscribers off, he said that people who were talking about this bill weren't giving any specifics, they were just saying that they were just going along with uh, the party line. They saw the protest, oh the protesters, they must be protesting for something just, and just knee-jerk uh, siding with the protesters. And I think that pissed a lot of people off, and and, and uh, so I want to give him him props uh, for that. Of course, he didn't go any further than that, and I only watched about five minutes of the video. And in the description, he said, "P.S. I don't support the stuff, um, the, the limiting of collective bargaining uh, stuff in the bill." Okay, and he put, put put that in the description. I don't know if he said that anywhere else. In the video, but but he said in the description that he does not support the uh, restrictions on on collective bargaining in that thing. Now, when talking about collective bargaining, let's first try to figure out bargaining. Um, do you need a law to bargain? No, you don't need you don't need laws to bargain. As an individual, you don't need laws to bargain. So. And and, of course, and we call that ha haggling. But you need laws to collectively bargain. I would say you don't need laws to collectively collectively bargain. When you take a look at, say, uh, someone hiring a plumber, let's say you hire a plumber to, f to fix a leak, what are you doing with them? Well, they, you are paying them to perform a task, to fix the leak or connect the pipes or whatever. You, you are paying them some resources in order to perform a task. Now, let's say someone... Um, you you do this for an extended period of time. Let's say you do this for eight hours one day. It's an eight-hour job. Let's say it's an eight-hour job five days a week. Let's say it's just easier for you to, you know, you have this really big building, and it's easier for you to just have a plumber on hand all the time. And so you pay him, well, I, I can't pay you, you know, your typical rate, but I can pay you at a reduced rate, but I will get, I will allow you to be the plumber for uh, eight hours a day, you know, five days a week. So you'll have work, you know, uh, eight hours a day, five five days a week, and so and it'll be more guaranteed income for you, even though it's at a, at a reduced rate. And so what's happening here is basically large firms are purchasing the services of people, uh, purchasing the labor of people at bulk rates um, for an extended period of time. So, that and that's all a, quote, job, close quote, is. So nobody really has a job. Uh, and, and I think this 
saying people have a job. It makes, you know, I, I kind of understand why people would say I have a job, he has a job, she has a job. And it makes sense to, to, to use that. It, it's a convenient way to explain this, but it's misleading and it gives people a false sense of entitlement as they as if they you know a job is something that they own and that if they get fired it's as if someone is taking away their job from them no it's just a trade and it's just an extended trade let's say you hired a plumber you're back back to the individual the individual hires a plumber and the plumber goes outside of the house uh, with a picket sign and he says I demand a hundred bucks to fix this pipe as opposed to the sixty bucks that I normally charge. I demand a hundred dollars in order in order to, to fix that fix that leak. And he has a picket sign in and you say, Well I'm not gonna pay that. There's this guy, this other guy who's charges seventy bucks, so I'm gonna go ahead and call that guy. And that guy comes in and this plumber, you know, has a picket line and he tr prevents prevents his other plumber from getting into your house. I mean it's a stupid situation, and it's, it's an absurd situation. And in that environment, there are so few people involved that you can that people can generally see the absurdity of that situation. But as soon as you have long-term bulk rate uh, labor trades, that is when it becomes uh, a bigger issue. That, that, that is when people can no longer see the absurdity and, and the reason is because it's a lot more people and they ha and it's this mentality that I have a job I have a job as opposed to no you're just in, engaging in an extended period of trades now would we say that the person who called a new plumber fired the old plumber I wouldn't say so uh, I mean, because like, like the, the the whole language of firing doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like the old plumber was not well. It it can make sense if the plumber's doing a bad job and you cancel. Like, I'm not I'm not working with you anymore. I'm going to get someone who can, who can do the job. But if he's just not straight up not showing up, it's like well, I need someone to fix the light, fix 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 the leak. So I'm going to call someone else. I'm going to call another plumber. Same way you could get a guy who has a factory instead of a house. Says well. I need a guy to run this machine, so I'm going to call someone else to run this machine. Just, and, and that's all it is. I'm not against collective bargaining, and I'm sure Scott Walker is not against collective bargaining either. I, I'm virtually certain that, that, that he's not. Because all collective bargaining would be, uh, it's like, like on the individual level, you know, have individual bargaining, you and the plumber bargain on a price. Maybe he says, this is my price and you accept it, or maybe you haggle or not. You know, it's it's a bargain. Or, you know, you can have a bunch of people work for a company and they all get together and say, all right, we're going to, you know, we want more for, for what we're doing. And then the factory owner can accept the new wage or deny it. Yeah. So... There's really no problem. I don't think anyone really has a problem with collective bargaining. And so to say that um, this bill is to restrict collective bargaining is a little bit disingenuous. Um, but not entirely disingenuous, and I'll explain why. Uh, the reason is that this is an artificial environment. This is not a market exchange. There are two significant problems with state employees that firms don't have. Uh, for example, when you hire a plumber, you're going to take price into consideration and you're going to take quality into consideration and you're going to try to get the best, you know, what is for you the best deal. Some really rich people from who to whom money is no object, they'll hire the, the fanciest plumber there is, but most people will, ha will you know, have to balance cost and quality. Um, and so th there is there's a ration, there's an incentive for you to do that. When you're spending other people's money, when you're taking you know cash in um, as a politician, and you're doling this cash out, uh, you don't have that same incentive because it's not your money. It's not like oh, money left over goes to you. No, it's money left over it goes to paying off the budget deficit or or the debt, and that's less dollars that you can then hand out. Right? And so politicians actually have an incentive to spend as much as they can, even going so far as deficit spending and borrowing in order to, to, exp 
to spend. Because then what happens is when their term is up, they're out, and the next guy comes in, he has to deal with that debt, not you. Okay? So the whole s disciplinary system that, that or the, the, the discipline in bargaining that it, that, that, that results in people bargaining in a market does not exist in a state. It's kind of an artificial environment. So when a bunch of union guys come up and say, we demand higher wages, the politicians may be like, yeah, sure, that'd be great. Hey, I'm going to give in to your demands because so, that's the kind of guy I am. All right, And so you should vote for me next election. Whereas you know, a factory owner is like, well, that's real money. That's real money that I have. Our profit margins are not that big. We don't have that much more to give. I'm not, you know, my lifestyle is kind of lavish, but as a percentage, it's not <laughs> really noteworthy at all. Okay. So, and another problem, it's not your money, so people spend it more. And, and there's, uh, you're kicking the can down the line. Another part of this bill, and, and this is and this is gets uh, back to the bill. The bill prevents people prevents the unions from bargaining on entitlements on um, or benefits. I'll call them benefits, um, pensions and health care. Because what was happening is a politician would promise the union members, uh, would, pro would promise the state employees, union member or not, they'll, they'll promise the state employees uh, great pensions and great health care benefits. And he'll promise them in his term. But the thing is, health care benefits typically don't get redeemed until someone gets older. Like your body starts to break down, that's when you need the medical attention. And of course, retirement, you don't redeem that until you're older as well. So in the first phase of this, you could have a governor saying, hey, I'm going to promise you lavish pensions and lavish health care. Okay? And he doesn't have to pay for any of that. He just promises it. All right? He's out of office. And then some other guy comes in, and then he, that other guy has to pay for it. So that guy who made the promises, he gets, all, he, he gets all the love for it. He gets all the electoral love, maybe some kickbacks. Uh, we don't know. But, but he gets all the, the political benefit from that. The next guy comes in, he has to pay for all of that. He, he gets all the pain for that. And if he's going to cut, like Wonker's doing, you know, he's going to get a bunch of political pain for that. All right? And that's the rationale behind limiting collective bargaining, especially limiting, uh, limiting collective bargaining for state employees, especially limiting collective bargaining for state employees in things that are not paid for immediately. So you can still engage in vote buying after this bill. But it's a little bit more difficult because you can, they can only uh, negotiate wages. And, and the reason for that is that wages are paid right now. You know, if you want all the political love from you know, paying these state employees a, a bunch of extra money, you're also going to get the political pain. The, the person who dishes out the money also, gets the, also has to pay for it. Okay? It's, it's reconnecting... Uh, payment from consequence, payment to consequence. So that's the rationale behind this. Barring collective bargaining in a market environment is clearly tyrannical. Okay, it's basically it's as tyrannical as as barring bargaining in an individual environment. It makes no it, it, and and of course prices come about from bargaining. So to be against collective bargaining. I don't know what that would even mean to be against collective bargaining in a market. But when you're in a system where there is no real price mechanism, like the state, because the state gets money and spends it on stuff, and the state, in theory, can spend on stuff up to the point of revolution. It, they can do a bunch of bullshit until the people start getting out their pitchforks and torches and stuff. And democracy, I don't want to get into this here, but there's lots of reasons why democracy fails, systematically fails, at preventing this kind of stuff. Rational ignorance is one, package deals is one, like you don't get to, like for example, you go to a store, you get to buy each individual item you want. Um, in politics, you, you don't get to uh, vote for each little item you want. In direct democracy, you do, you get that advantage, but direct democracy has a whole 
a whole slew of disadvantages that that go, go along with that. Um, and I don't I don't I don't have time to get into that. That's not the point here. The point is, democracy does not effectively uh, regulate against that. And also, you get voting wars, and so yeah, like Group A voting themselves the resources of Group B. So, anything else I wanted to say? Yeah, basically, it's an artificial environment where you know the natural regulatory mechanisms that occur in bargaining between parties on a market don't exist in a state environment and so it makes sense to strictly prescribe what state employees can do because there's no real price system like there is in normal bargaining in normal bargaining agreements between uh, a, a bulk rate labor trade or job um, I think that's all I wanted to say here I'm looking at, at these uh, stuff, I, I heard there was a, a lawsuit having to do with like some cafeteria, SCIU, is that, is some cafeteria company that, that does most of the cafeterias for the high schools in the, in the U.S. Um, they're suing the union, and if, and, if they're, and if they win, that the SCIU could be like completely bankrupted. Uh, this Wisconsin protest, I know, is costing whatever the relevant union is, uh, a lot of money for that. Uh, it's costing that public sector union, I, forget, I don't know what the name is of that public sector union, but it's costing them a lot of money because AstroTurf, <laughs> because that's what all these protesters are, that they're busing them, and there's there's a lot of grassroots, there's a lot of genuine stuff, but they're also busing in a lot of people from out of state in order to protest, and that is expensive because they did not want this stuff to be passed. Now. What happened is that the Republicans uh, found out that, for whatever reason, they didn't need to have a quorum for this kind of bill. Like the the Democrats left because they didn't because the Democrat uh, in Congress, their idea was that we'll leave, they won't have a quorum, they can't pass anything, so they won't be able to pass this bill because the Democrats were in the minority, and so uh, and the Republicans were going to be able to pass it. Um, so there wasn't a quorum, and so it looked like the Republicans were not going to be able to pass it until the Democrats came back. Well, as it turned out, um, you only need a quorum, as, it, as the law is written in Wisconsin, you only need a quorum for uh, things that are going to incre basically increase taxes or negatively affect the budget deficit, or that they're going to increase the, the budget deficit, okay? you don't need a quorum for things that reduce the deficit okay so that's uh... and so, and so the republicans heard that and said alright so we're gonna go ahead and pass that i suspect that the republicans knew this all along and what they but what they wanted to do is they wanted to make it look like they didn't know this so that the union could spend a bunch of money on these protests and basically bleed the union bank account before they you know went ahead and passed it which they knew they could do all along, so and and that's what I think uh, they did, and so I'm and so props to props to the Republicans for being Machiavellian like that, if that's in fact what they did. Um, that's the end of this video here. Um, just for the record, if this is the first video of mine that you've ever seen, I completely oppose the state uh, totally, so I think none of these state employees should be abolished completely, but I'm thinking, I'm just thinking inside the box right now just to show why uh, why barring collective bargaining privileges for state employees makes a certain amount of sense.